Whether two nuclei collide and fuse together depends on several things. Firstly, it depends on the number of nuclei present. Obviously, if there are fewer of them, then they are less likely to meet up and collide. Secondly, it depends on their kinetic energy. As previously explained, this must be great enough to allow the particles to overcome the electrostatic repulsion and get close enough for the strong force to take over and allow them to fuse. This is conveniently expressed by their velocity, which is a proxy for energy. Finally, it depends on another parameter, one which expresses the size of the target for the different nuclei. They have different physical sizes and different charges repelling each other, and so some convenient parameter is required in order to take this into account. All these factors are shown in the formula on the screen. R is equal to sigma times n subscript a times n subscript d times v. This result, r, is the number of fusions per cubic meter per second. If the two fusing particles are coming in from different directions, at different angles and different speeds, then the velocity v is the magnitude of the difference of their velocity. If both nuclei are the same, then we can reduce the previous formula to r is equal to a quarter sigma n squared v. n is now the number density of the single type of species involved. Now, temperature is just a measure of the average velocity of particles. So the idea in magnetically or inertially confined systems is that we generate the velocities required by heating up the plasma. For example, in a Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed particle system, the average velocity of a particle is given by the formula on the screen, where m is the particle mass and k is Boltzmann's constant. In such a system, then, the required temperature would be given by this formula. It turns out that to get a suitable velocity for fusion by putting numbers into these formulas, the required temperatures are in excess of 100 million Kelvin. As you might imagine, obtaining such huge temperatures and then confining the charged particles in such extreme conditions is not at all easy, and hence thermal fusion like this is very hard and a huge technological challenge, and one which we haven't cracked yet. But look back again at the governing equation. There actually isn't any temperature term in it, only velocity. And there is another way to obtain the required velocity. This second way is by electrostatic acceleration. It works like this. A charged particle like the positive nucleus can be accelerated by placing a negative grid in front of it. This attracts the particle, accelerating it to high speeds. But because the grid is so thin and hard to hit, most of the accelerated particles pass right through, but now they are travelling at these very high speeds. We can easily work out a formula for the velocity generated like this, and that's given on the screen. Here n is the number of protons in the nucleus, v is the accelerating voltage, e is the charge on an electron, and m is the mass of the nucleus we're trying to accelerate. The device required to do this is rather simple, and in fact, it's rather like the electron gun which was used in cathode ray tubes in old television sets. For a nuclei of deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen containing a proton and a neutron, and a material which is often used in nuclear fusion, acceleration through 150 kilovolts would produce a velocity of 3.8 million meters per second. As we'll see, this is actually a number which is realistic. One convenient way of measuring the energy of small particles related to this is to use a system called electron volts. One electron volt, which is abbreviated EV, is the energy gained by an electron when it's accelerated through a potential of one volt. Particle energies are often quoted like this, and they are often in the range of kilo electron volts, which is a thousand electron volts, or mega-electron volts, which is a million electron volts. 